this study is actually in association with C4, um, the Global Comparative Study, as well as another project from Europe, the EU, called New Forex, New Ways of Valuing Forest Externalities, particularly focusing on Bolsa Floresta, which is um, a program here, which is basically like a payment for environmental services program that's um, ongoing at the moment. Um, and this is actually an annex to the actual GCS program in Brazil. So there's four other GCS um, projects which are being studied at the moment and the Bolsa Foresta will just supplement that data. And the reason why the Bolsa Foresta is not formally included into the GCS is because it's already started so we can't get the before scenario. Logistically it's, it's quite challenging to work in the Amazon because I don't know if you can see in the background but there's a, a big river and this is where all the communities are located. In the previous reserve we were also working on um, riparian communities, that is communities situated along the river. So we hired a boat which has a living area, a bath, toilet, a, um, a kitchen and we basically chug along down the river from, we, we do the big journey upriver and then we stop in villages along the way. And all of us sleep, eat and bathe on the boat. We've got a cook which we pay to cook us um, breakfast, lunch and dinner. We have a driver of the boat, captain, and we also hire a speedboat and a driver as well to help us get around to some of the houses which are, you know, not actually in the community themselves. The team consists of four enumerators and a research assistant and myself. Um, the four enumerators, I actually flew in from other parts of Brazil. Two of these um, enumerators had actually worked on previous GCS projects. The research assistant was also a girl who I'd gotten a very high recommendation of, um, who'd worked in Acre, and she's my research assistant, so she helps me make contact in the village. When we arrive in a village, the both of us come into the village and, make, and talk to the president, and we introduce the project, we explain what we want to know, we explain what we're going to do. And then we sit down with the president and make a list of all the community, of all the households within the community. And then after that list is made, then we do a selection of the communities. At, the, at this moment, the sampling intensity is around 60 to 66 percent. So that means the 66 percent of all households within the community will be sampled. Um, and then once we have that list and the names, then we talk to our enumerators back on the boat and we send them out for their first interviews. So the GCS com is comprised of a household survey which basically documents um, the different income sources of each family. It also talks to them about their knowledge of RED and their involvement in Bolsa Floresta. And we've basically interviewed up to date 173 in Watuma Reserve, which is um, north of this reserve. And we've carried, around, carried out about 40 controls to questionnaires in this part of the Amazon, as well as 50 intervention questionnaires in this part of the Amazon. So we have about, I think, around about 70 questionnaires to go, just within the reserve. And the main purpose of this is basically to know uh, how these payments are contributing to the household subsistence and lifestyles, and also in a way to actually understand a bit more about their ways of living here, you know, are they making enough money from the forest? Do they actually take products from the forest? What is their main source of income? Is it planting manioc or is it fishing or is it hunting? And then on top of that we do several community surveys and women's surveys where we gather groups, focus groups, to talk to them about their knowledge of red, about some of the agricultural crops that they grow, maximum and minimum prices, salaries for them. This is all to try and understand a bit more about the socio-economic situation of the people here. The original GCS is, as I understand it, um, is doing the same thing and then they will revisit these same projects two years afterwards to actually to make a comparison to see if there has been any impacts of these payments. But unfortunately, as, as Bolsa Foresta has already started, we can't actually make that comparison. So we're just looking generally at the socioeconomic side of things. And then I've got my PhD study on top of this, which is looking specifically at um, their willingness to accept compensation. So I ask the families, each family in turn, to state a value which they'd be willing to accept per month in order to give up the right to, to deforest in their plot of land. 
and I also asked them um, how much they would be willing to give up if they weren't allowed to use any of the forest. So this will be supplementing the household income data that I have and then hopefully I can see some correlations of what types of people are stating higher values you know and those that are stating lower values and, and investigating why um, these, these range of values actually come up. Um, Balsa Floresta consists of four components. Um, you've got the Balsa Floresta Familiar, Balsa Floresta Renda, Balsa Floresta Social and Balsa Floresta Association. So Balsa Floresta Familiar is the one that has gotten, I guess, the most attention in the past because this is the 50 reais that each family gets each month to not cut down forest, to basically zero deforestation. The rules under Bols Forest Familiar is that they are allowed to open one hectare of secondary forest to plant, um, but they're not allowed to cut virgin forest. Um, they are allowed to harvest timber for the construction of houses, but then they, they are not allowed to harvest timber for, um, for commercial purposes. Bols Forest Renda composes of um, assistance from Fundação Amazona Sustentável, which is the foundation which is basically managing Bolsa Foresta and they give assistance in the form of um, small chickens um, to basically try and create asset wealth within the households. Bolsa Foresta Social and Association has got to do with providing money to first of all the community and also the associations within the community to build things like schools, um, health centres and this kind of thing. To receive Bosa Floresta, you're, you're asked not to open more virgin forest and only use one hectare of forest a, a year for their family for planting. Um, within the reserve, for example in Watuma, the restriction is that if you live in the reserve, you can open up to three hectares of forest and plant. Um, but if you receive Bosa Floresta, then this is shortened down to one. So I guess um, what this means is that the area of land that they're actually planting to, to eat, um, to sell their products is much smaller. That's the restriction. That's, that's what they're giving up for get, to get this 50 reais a month. I would say the main challenge is um, how do we get the money to the ground? I mean, there is a lot of interest in, in red and making it work. Like the Norwegian government has already invested millions of dollars into forest-rich countries to try and get this red project happening. Most of these countries that have tropical forests, they are developing countries. So how do we get the money to trickle down to the people? And how do we do this most efficiently as well? Do we just give this blanket payment, uniform payments to all of the people? Um, how do we meet true opportunity costs of all the people? And I see that's um, a major, major challenge in making red work because we do have limited funds and we need to use it as wisely as possible. And I might be coming from a very economic point of view, but I see it as, yes, if, if the funds are limited, then let's use it wisely. So we need to basically be able to meet opportunity. I mean, a, a uniform payment is not going to work for a person who owns a fazenda with like thousands heads of cattle. I mean, if he receives 50 reais or even just, you know, a same payment as the person who might have you know only 20 heads of cattle I mean they're not going to be happy one's going to feel very rewarded the other person's going to feel like well this is doing nothing for me so I need to keep doing what I do to make my living in that sense so how do we get around meeting true opportunity costs is one particular challenge but to take it on a further level and maybe a level up is more about um, how do we actually get policy changed in these countries? How do we get government interests turned towards avoiding deforestation instead of harvesting timber? In places like Indonesia, the DRC, you know, and, and possibly in some parts of the Brazil as well, there is a lot of timber barons that, that work very closely with local or state governments. And you, it's, it's very hard to change that politically. It's very hard to get the political will to really implement red projects effectively if, um, if they've got interests on the side, commercial interests on the side. And I think that's, that's one of the major problems, especially in 
you know, forest expanses like Indonesia and, and Africa and some parts of Brazil as well. I guess the idea behind PES is to be an incentive to people. So this amount of money should be an incentive for them not to deforest. But the problem that we, we can see with a lot of other programs as well is that sometimes that incentive is not big enough to be an incentive. Instead, it's just a supplement to the income. I think that another challenge is how do we actually create an effective monitoring system um, that people are complying toward, to this particular program and other red programs. When you're dealing with communities that are so isolated and so far apart, you aren't um, able to, as, as one organisation, to have a presence in every single community. I mean, some of the communities that we visited, we're talking, you know, 15 hours by boat at least. And that's, that's a very long way to go to, to kind of, you know, stay for a little while, see what's going on and then go back. I mean, and also enforcement and monitoring can't be just a snapshot, like one day a year, it needs to be ongoing. No, I really do believe that um, people need to be compensated for a loss. I think the days of expecting that the romantic native that works for the good of the environment, those days are long gone and I don't know if they ever existed actually. That was maybe just a discourse in the environmental movement and we wanted to keep everyone kind of in loincloths and you know, living off the land. Uh, but I actually believe the payments for environmental services is, is quite important because what we're asking them to do is to maybe not continue the things that they used to do in the past. And in order for them to keep living, then they do need to be compensated to a certain extent. This type of research that C4 is doing, it's, it's a start into understanding exactly how payments can actually help and also into understanding how we can make it better and more effective and more efficient. Yeah, eventually we'll get there and I think um, it's the most effective um, effective and easy, or easier I should say, way to uh, minimise the impacts of global warming in a very sh short time frame.